as Nigerian youths commemorate the first anniversary of the Lekki Toll shooting, we look at some of the unresolved issues, including protesters' demands and justice for the victims of police brutality. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Paul. It's been a year since the Lekki toll shooting, a moment that came from the historic NSARS protest. It was triggered by the excesses of special anti-robbery uh, squad, SARS. The are now disbanded police tactical unit, notorious for cruelty against uh, crime suspects. Although SARS activities included unlawful arrest, torture, and extrajudicial killings, the protest became a platform to demand government's decisive actions against insecurity, corruption, economic wars, general maladministration, and the lack of opportunities for the youth. To break all of these down, we are, have with us journalist uh, Imo Edet and Jonathan Abang. Also, we have our, our correspondent from PLOS TV Africa, um, Destiny. Um, Destiny, thank you very much for joining us anymore. Jonathan, thank you all for joining us. We're starting this segment with you because, you thank know, you, you. you are the fourth estate of the realm and you're going to give us all the reports that you've gotten from today and, of course, last year. But I'll start with Destiny. Destiny Momo is our in-house correspondent. She was at the Lekki Toll um, early this morning uh, down to the afternoon when... Uh, the police decided to, you know, tear gas those who were at the toll gate. But Destiny, give us a, a just a basic, um, um, you know, view of what you saw while you were covering uh, the protest today. You know, when I got to the um, toll gates, um, the number of protesters I saw, I was I was shocked because I thought that because of what happened last year, people were not going to come out as much. But the one was I was amazed when I got there. You know, there were so many people and like they were ready, they were ready, you know, it, because of the pain and anguish over the last year, they had to come to, you know, I don't know, maybe to show love to their loved ones that their lives ended at this toll gate, same time last year. So um, the protest, at the end of the day, um, uh, the, the lawyer to the protesters actually came and said that, it was time for them to leave. I'm, I'm sure he was perceiving, you know, some unrest, sort of. But after he spoke, it wasn't even up to five minutes. We started hearing shots, different sounds, gunshots, um, um, tear gas, you know. And then I started running at that point. I knew that I had to start running. But I was shocked because just very three days ago, I was interviewing some N stars, victims, you know, people that were there on that night of the shootout. And then I was I, I, I was getting so emotional when they were pouring out their hearts of what happened. But I never knew that I was going to experience something of that sort myself. So I was shocked that I was actually hearing this gun shot. You know, because there were lots of security operatives around. This gun shot, I don't know what I was gun shot or um, tear gas. But at the end of the day, all I felt was peppery sensation in my eyes coming straight into my cubes, my nose but I, I was just feeling this all round peppery sensation and I was practically passing out. I'm, I'm trying to understand out. why or what would have necessitated, you know, this act by the police because at the time that I was at that toll gate briefly, um, it seemed to be peaceful and calm. Um, we saw that the protesters were in their vehicles. They were hardly on foot. People who were mostly on foot were the journalists that were coming, covering the event. Was there any unrest of sorts? Or did you see people who uh, looked like they were agitators or trying to you know, disrupt the protests? Could that have been the reason why the, prote well, like the said, police did what the they did? Because we are pouring out their anguish, their pain. You know, I'm, I'm sure it was like, like um, maybe because of the pain of what happened last year. And earlier before I got there, some IS were already made. You know, but then they, they foresaw that the protest was going to be hijacked. And then they had to disperse protesters using that method. That's what I perceive. 
Mm. Because people were practically running. I was running. I had to go, you know, I had to pass through a barbed wire into the waterways. And this this part was really narrow. And you can see my size on the big on the big side. I had to squeeze myself. I practically swam inside the sand just to save my life. I was gasping for breath. Mm. Interesting. Um we we did before this protest even happened, we we of course had the CP. Uh, when he had tried to dissuade Lagosians from coming out to protest. Uh, but then we saw a man who was, I don't know if we have that video clip, a man who was trying to speak on behalf of the police, um, you know, trying to advocate, saying that the police, one of the reasons why we're protesting is so that the police can get good welfare. As he was speaking about it, he was taken away by the same police. He was malhandled and thrown into the Black Maria, as we can see in that video. And we've seen several other people pepper sprayed directly in their eyes. Uh, we saw uh, one of uh, the, our TV stations in uh, um, Lagos here, a Rice TV's correspondent, who, who, a lady also who was man, malhandled by the police. So it really makes us wonder if the police understands what's in the Constitution as to protecting peaceful protesters as opposed to harassing them. Okay, then, uh, like I told you, he wasn't the only one that was inside the Black Maria. I, uh, I think we lost connection. So be, earlier before I got there, arrests were already made. You could hear people shouting that they were just passing, that they didn't do anything. That they were just passing, you know, that they didn't do anything, just giving their reasons. But at the end of the day, protesters were busy shouting that, um, you know, um, people that were arrested same time last year, exactly a year ago, people that were just passerby, people going to their different places of work or coming back, were arrested. And up until now, they are still inside the police cell. Mm. All right, um, let me go to Jonathan. Jonathan, you obviously are in the media, you write. Um, I'm guessing that today you're going to have a field day writing from all angles and all pers perspective and uh, all the information that you're getting. I do not necessarily know if there was a protest in Cross River State for answers, um, but from all the information that you gathered, either from the, uh, the Abuja protest or the Lagos protest, a bird's eye view of what you gathered today, is, does it give you a nostalgic feeling or is there really hope for justice to be done for the people who were killed at that toll gate? Mariana, well, of course, uh, it's it's a feeling of deja vu because uh, uh, it's happening all over again. And uh, it's even troubling and mind boggling. It's benumbing to uh, see, you know, a privileged Nigerian who occupies uh, the position of Minister for Information. Because what he wrote today, uh, honestly, I, I don't think uh, I'm in the right frame of mind to call out uh, his name. It, 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 will only, uh, it will only help stupefy me the most. Uh, it's it, from Lagos to Abuja and across uh, the country. What we basically saw the police and other uh, you know, law enforcement agencies do is the same thing they have been doing over the years that led to the NSAS uh, protest. Now, if you follow the uh, Human Rights Watch and, of course, uh, the reports we are getting right now is, in fact, from January 1 up until October 1, no fewer than a hundred and thirty extrajudicial killings were carried out by uh, what we call it uh, law enforcement agencies in Nigeria. Now, some people will ask, okay, uh, where's the statistics for this? These things are not reported in the media and uh, what have you. But if you hear a case of one today, two tomorrow, three tomorrow, you'll never get to really know uh, that, okay, over time these things are uh, uh, happen. And uh, from in Cross River, there was no protest, but what happened was even much more silly. Yeah, you know, we had, uh, we have medical interns in the uh, teaching hospital here who are old a lot months and the management called in police to chase them away. You had old women who are paid 7,500 7, a month uh, to sweep the roads in Calabar. They have been old for over six months. They went out to protest and policemen came there who did policemen fired tear gas at 60, 70, 80 year old women? So while uh, NSAS, the NSAS memorial protest did not happen across the country as many people would have uh, expected, but we still saw 
uh, you know, brutality from law enforcement agents, uh, agency go on. And besides, you look at uh, the so-called judicial panels on uh, 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 judicial panels of inquiry into police brutality and what have you across the country. Recommendations have been made in some. Eleven states have made recommendations. Some states have even concluded sitting like Cross River, which was which happened since April, mm -hmm. but the recommendations have not been made public. Now, apart from what uh, the privileged Nigerian who is fortunate to occupy the office of the Minister for Information, like I said, I'm not going to mention this name because uh, I don't think I'll it's going to be that often. Mr. Lai Mohamed. Yeah. Uh, whatever his name is, I, I, I don't care right now. He's a privileged Nigerian that I know uh, to be occupying that office. He abused that office today. And, you know, uh, the, apart from what he said from the uh, preliminary report from the panel of inquiry in Lagos State, no one else got to note it. So uh, the, the, clearly it uh, supports a stance uh, of uh, some of us that look at the end of the day, these things will just, uh, they were just, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, strategy, mere strategies to ensure that they take us all around and nothing happen, uh, nothing positive comes out of it. I'm going to quickly toss to Imo. Imo is a broadcast journalist with the West African Democratic Radio in Dakar, Senegal. He's a Nigerian, obviously, and I know how very interested and um, how much spotlight you, are, you have on Nigeria today reporting on the NSAS memorial. I'm sure that you have colleagues who are really wondering what's going on in Nigeria, but we saw, as at yesterday when I was on my way to work, I saw the police and their vans and their Amot tanks by the Lekki toll. Um, and, and some people would say this is a show of force. Some people would say it's a form of intimidation. And this could have happened in other places in the country. Um, do you think, Imo, that maybe these, this, this form of intimidation has worked over time and that's why we only saw Lagos and Abuja where people really actually summoned the courage to come out? Uh, and, and to show their respects or pay respects to the dead and, and those who were beaten and battered or even those who were still in police custody. Uh, thanks, Han, for having me. I think this may have played a role in we not seeing the crowd that uh, you know we had envisaged, but but uh, be as that may be, we saw people still come out to you know show solidarity, especially for those who lost their lives last year. Well. Um, whether my colleagues or you know the people here know about that, yes, everybody is concerned about the answers. Uh, it was a big deal for us here uh, last year because of the massive coverage we gave, you know, to that rally, and of course we did that also today. Uh, hearing from Abuja, we were able to speak with uh, Showere, who was um, you know um, barricaded by the police, and we had over thirty minutes of exchanges of word, and eventually they had to you know, uh, turned back because of a pro uh, NSAS group, you know, a paid NSAS group like we learned from our correspondent there, who came and in order to avoid trouble, uh, you know, like what happened last year, you know, they had to turn back. Now, my, my for me, I think um, the Nigerian police uh, is not learning and um, they have continued to fail over time. Not learning from antecedents, not learning from uh, what had transpired in the past 365 days, not learning from what actually the protest is meant for. Um, a very good example is the individual that was picked up earlier ago, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, a, in a spot where. And there are some people who are conversing for better welfare for the police. There are people who want, you know, uh, a total overhaul of the police system. I mean, it's for their own benefit, not just for the people that they, you know, they are meant to protect. It's for their own benefit. But for the fact that this thing has transpired for one year now. I still can't understand that these guys can come out to, to rally or do whatever they want to do with you giving them the support instead of the harassment that we saw today, uh, the intimidation that we saw today. I, I think it's appalling, especially when you have the international communities, you know, listening, watching, you know, getting what is going on in Nigeria. It, it paints a very bad image for the force. And I must say that the current IG isn't really doing anything. And, 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 uh, this is even when um, he, I, I know people don't resign easily in Nigeria, but I would say this would have been, you know, that point he would say, look, I am tired. I'm not doing it anymore. If this reform is not working, so let it be. For me, he should, he should put in the pen and, and move away and let them get somebody who can, who can make sure that the reform works. Now, part of what we asked you already this morning was that if any of the reform, the five demands uh, last year has been met, and he said none. 
Yes, we understand that states have been putting up, you know, um, panel of inquiries, some victims have been compensated, mm -hmm. but is that enough to really drive on the point of the protesters? So for me, I think a whole lot still needs to be done. Well, I want to say thank you. Imo Edet is a broadcast journalist with the West African Democratic Radio in Dakar, Senegal. Uh, Jonathan uh, is of the Cross River Watch. He is a print journalist. And Destiny Momo is our in-house correspondent here with PLOS TV Africa. Thank you, gentlemen. We have to go. We have a long list of people to talk with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll take a quick break now. And when we return, more on the NSAS Remembrance and weather. Justice will take its course. Stay with us.